Hello everyone, thank you for joining our research roundtable online. On behalf of the Department of Communication, University of Hyderabad, I welcome you. We are holding the meeting here on Zoom and live casting it on Facebook. Pranay will just share the link in chat. If you fall off the meeting here or want to share this talk with someone else, please use that link. We would like to ensure that all the interactions in this forum take place in a cordial, collegial and harassment-free environment. This means that the space is welcoming and respectful to all interested participants, regardless of identity, location, and background. We expect you to follow the rules of engagement. Check your username and change it to your name if needed. Turn off your microphones and videos uh, for a smooth meeting with minimum lag. Raise your hand or post your question in the chat section and wait for the moderator's instructions. Harassment of any kind and in any form, either verbal or non-verbal, in the chat or in questions and responses will not be tolerated, including deliberate intimidation or disruption during or after the talk. Those who do not comply with normal standards of decency and respect may have your account disabled and their participation in the current and future forums blocked. If you notice anyone engaging in potentially disruptive or disrespectful behavior, please inform the administrator His email ID is pranay at the read uohyd.ac.in. The meeting is structured as follows. Introducing the speaker, presentation by the speaker, short discussion and inviting questions from the participants, live Q&A, open for all, moderated by host, wrap up and closing. Please remember to note your questions as the speaker is presenting. Raise your hand when questions are invited um, and wait for the moderator's instructions for your turn to ask. Kindly turn your microphone and or video on when it is your turn. Or you could also post your name, affiliation, and question in the chat if you'd like to, the moderator to ask on your behalf. Today, we have with us Professor Mohan Datta, and he will be speaking on communication inequalities and discursive erasures, the fate of migrant labor during the COVID-19 crisis in India. Mohan, sir, is the Dean's Chair Professor at School of Communication, Journalism, and Marketing, Massey University. He's also Director, Centre for Culture-Centred Approach to Research and Evaluation, Care, and Editor-in-Chief of two journals, Journal of Applied, Applied Communication Research and Frontiers in Health Communication. He was also recently honoured and elected Fellow at the prestigious International Communication Association during their 70th annual conference. Congratulations again, sir. Uh, he's kindly shared two papers for us and I'm sending the link in chat for everyone to view. Hello, Professor Datta, welcome. Over to you, please. Hi, Devina. Thank you so much for inviting me. I also want to thank uh, several colleagues at um, the University of Hyderabad, uh, Usha Raman, Vinod Pavrala, uh, who have um, been inspiring role models in a lot of my own uh, journey. Uh, it's really wonderful to be here with you on this uh, platform. And what I will do today is uh, share a brief um, a snippet from my ongoing ethnographic field work um, across seven urban sites in um, India uh, that is uh, carried out under the umbrella of the center that I direct, CARE, and then juxtapose this field work in the backdrop of um, the field work that I've been carrying out over really the last two decades um, at uh, India's rural margins. Uh, one of the things that I hope to demonstrate uh, through this uh, talk is uh, the interplay of the rural and the urban and uh, the ways in which communicative uh, inequalities and discursive erasures constitute the infrastructures uh, that um, form the fabric on, on which we uh, see on one hand uh, the expulsions of the rural poor from their livelihoods um, at India's uh, rural margins. Um, and then the incorporation of the uh, rural poor into India's um, urban sites of imagining uh, digital development, uh, digital futures and smart infrastructures. I will uh, then argue that communicative inequalities constitute uh, the overarching structures within which these processes of expulsion and incorporation uh, take place. 
specifically looking then at uh, some of the narrative accounts that emerge from um, the fieldwork that I've been doing uh, since um, March and uh, much more so in the months of April and May, uh, primarily through uh, telephone and digital interactions with uh, migrant workers. And then situate that within the context of imagining what a future uh, looks like uh, that addresses uh, the kinds of inequalities that have become evident within the context of the COVID-19 pandemic. So this um, talk is structured in terms of um, addressing four uh, key aspects. Uh, first is looking at and explaining communicative inequalities and discursive erasures. Then situating these within the context of the question of hyper, hyper precarity, discardability and death, where I would argue that um, communicative inequalities lie at the heart of uh, discardability of the bodies of the poor. And then looking at uh, what are the possibilities then for imagining resistance, particularly anchored in communicative democracy and um, uh, movements that seek to address the question of voice and voice infrastructures. So communication inequality in a nutshell is inequality in the distribution of communicative resources, both resources related to information as well as resources for voice. Uh, now, within the context of India, and you have to situate this, of course, within the broader uh, narrative of what we see globally, uh, there is increasing marginalization of the poorer sectors of the globe, uh, particularly in terms of communicative access to voice infrastructures, infrastructures where their voices can be heard in ways that are meaningful, in ways that impact policymaking, and in ways that are accountable uh, to the poor. So this process of marginalization then has actually been orchestrated by a network of global institutions uh, that range all the way from hegemonic development agencies such as uh, USAID and DFID, global foundations such as uh, the Clinton Foundation and uh, Gates Foundation, and um, uh, international financial institutions like the uh, World Bank and International Monetary Fund. One of the characteristics of communicative inequality in this sense is uh, the concentration of power in the hands of experts making decisions often technocratic, techno-deterministic, technology-driven decisions and uh, framing these decisions as decisions of development while at the same time uh, working to erase uh, the articulations and spaces of articulations from the subaltern uh, margins. So this expertise then at the same time is situated in the backdrop of ongoing erasure of democratic possibilities and spaces with often a deployment of various forms of attacks, including uh, violent attacks um, using the paramilitary, the police and the military to silence the voices of the subaltern margins. At the same time then the irony of um, communicative inequality lies in the performance of democracy through the um, emergence of and proliferation of so-called participatory infrastructures, engagement-based infrastructures that are often dictated by World Bank, IMF. So if you just track the number of participatory projects that have been funded by the bank within this very context, you see the massive rise in such participatory projects, um, of course, constituted within the logics of the bank and within the logics of the state working alongside transnational capital and pushing the ideology of the free market. So often you see this in the form of uh, public private partnerships, CSR based organizations, communication based engagement organizations that are running these participatory forums, often within a uh, techno-capitalist agenda. This at the same time is tied to the increasing violence and the role of police and military uh, carrying out violence on the subaltern uh, sectors at subaltern sites of articulations across uh, India's subaltern margins. If you consider uh, the um, 
uh, preponderance of subaltern agency amidst these development projects uh, within the context of India's uh, Eastern Belt, uh, where you see various forms of indigenous uprisings. Uh, these have been systematically targeted, not just by the current disposition of um, a neo-fascist regime, but uh, before that, um, um, uh, Congress-led government as well, uh, that orchestrated various forms of political violence in order to silence these uh, spaces of articulation, often on one hand under the name of development, and on the other hand by framing these sites of articulation as terror or terrorist threat. Uh, consider, for instance, in um, the not too distant past, uh, the image of Operation Green Hunt and the narrative of Operation Green Hunt and the ways in which uh, that narrative was deployed to uh, catalyze various forms of state-sponsored violence, uh, often again under the narrative of uh, managing terror. That narrative, of course, has now been um, uh, further catalyzed uh, through the discursive constructions of the anti-national threat, uh, the um, uh, management of the Maoist threat, and that becomes a basis for attacking sites of articulation, sites of dissent, and sites of democratic um, uh, imagination. So communicative inequalities then actually uh, point us toward a few questions that we ought to be asking. The first question is in terms of communicative ownership. Who owns these communicative spaces? Who sets the agendas on these communicative spaces? Who holds the power in shaping communicative processes? And increasingly we see uh, the consolidation of power in the hands of uh, both um, the capitalist class as well as in the hands of um, state actors uh, pushing forth a neo-fascist agenda. And at the same time, then you see this communicatively in terms of the very nature of communication and expectations about communication um, that be formulated in the forms of top-down one-way communication. So you have uh, the prime minister's um, uh, radio um, um, uh, uh, based articulations that are staged and almost performed as one-way propaganda. You have uh, the prime minister's uh, televised messages, but never a press conference or never an opportunity for a two-way dialogue uh, that is not managed, uh, that is not um, held within uh, the logics of structure. So within this setting, then we ought to be asking what, for what purposes are these communicative infrastructures uh, mobilized and with what agendas? And this, of course, has tremendous relevance for uh, the COVID-19 crisis, particularly in terms of um, what we um, the witness with regard to the experiences of uh, low-wage migrant workers, really asking uh, within this context, what are the spaces um, of articulation that are available to migrant workers? And what you see when you do um, a survey of the discursive spaces and discursive sites is the predominance of um, hegemonic uh, articulations, the predominance of state actors uh, narrating uh, their understanding of uh, the crisis. Um, alongside, of course, um, civil society voices here and there, uh, but of course, uh, at, at a much lower proportion compared to uh, the predominance of uh, state actors or uh, state-related actors. And then the migrant of workers, of course, are at the very margins of the margins, only to emerge as images, only to emerge as uh, um, uh, disembodied uh, bodies, you know, bodies without voice to be circulating in these communicative spaces. So integral to the performance of these communicative inequalities and to their production are communicative inversions. And in my work, I argue that these communicative inversions are the fundamental turning on their head of material realities to project the direct opposite. So when uh, migrant workers, for instance, are uh, being thrown into the uh, streets, into the highways without fundamental access to uh, protections of housing, food, transportation, the narrative that is uh, thrown onto the discursive space is one of kindness, one of altruism, one of um, an efficient and effective state. 
So uh, this capacity to perform communicative um, inversions is tied to uh, the nature of fascist propaganda, where on one hand, uh, alternatives sites of dissent are systematically targeted as against the interests of the nation. And on the other hand, uh, one way messaging focuses on continually disseminating the communicative um, um, inversions. So the co-option, colonization and silencing of spaces of dissent um, by marking them as anti-national forms a critical element of this infrastructure of communicative inversions. And within this backdrop, then you have the deployment of state, the police, uh, the paramilitary and non-state actors perpetuating various forms of violence, which are uh, regularized or justified as uh, state's forms of uh, management or managing uh, the crisis. So I wanted to draw this example by uh, walking through uh, the uh, Pune smart city, uh, imagery, uh, just as one example in terms of how uh, inversions are carried out. But this forms what I argue in my work, uh, the infrastructure of the uh, Joomla Republic, you know, the communicative infrastructure of the Joomla Republic, where uh, the material, uh, material imaginaries of the Republic are based upon layers and layers and layers of communicative inversion. So let's watch a little bit of this video. I'm just looking at the time. I invite you to watch the video uh, further and we can provide you the link to it. Uh, but I just wanted to have you get a snippet of what I mean by communicative inversions. So the smart city vision of Pune is all about how to transform the lives of the citizens of Pune. When government of India announced the idea of smart city, Pune uh, took part in it initially and Pune was ranked as second. The project is implemented on public and private partnership basis with no cost to the city. Basically, this project is about uh, replacing 70,000 LED lights of different types. Changes were a change of feel of the current. The lights are very good. The features are very good. In fact, uh, driving doesn't seem to be like, like a nightmare to me anymore. What we have gone ahead with this project is by not only converting all the street lights into LED, but also controlling them centrally through a command control center, bringing that element of smart lighting so you know citizens, if they have any complaints about lights not working, immediately can use our mobile app send a complaint to the command control center. There is an SLA behind this, a service level agreement, and the light is fixed in time. As far as safety is concerned, I can say that, you know, being in the city, I feel so safe. I travel alone at night. I drive all the way from office to home. So, like, I don't have to rely on anybody else. So you have here the image of the smart city and the uh, usual narrative tropes of the smart city, uh, efficient government, effective management, uh, technology driven management that creates a sustainable uh, future that is safe and secure. And of course, you know, one of the things that I will argue through my field work and giving a little bit of snippets of that is that all of this and um, uh, the Joomla-ness of all of this, right? That this, these are all communicative inversions become evident um, with uh, COVID-19. Of course, you know, the thing 
I have systematically argued in my uh, ethnographic work is that it is these forms of erasures in the uh, smart city imaginary, the erasures of the subaltern classes, the working classes uh, that form the infrastructures of the smart city uh, constitutes its um, infrastructure of propaganda and communicative inversions. With COVID-19, uh, these inequalities and these um, inversions tied to the inequalities and the work of erasing these inequalities actually becomes visible in some ways. So smart development within this context uh, forms the propaganda infrastructure of neoliberal authoritarianism. And uh, the visions for neoliberal futures in this sense is authoritarian because it needs to deploy uh, violence and techniques of violence and techniques of disciplining through the deployment of the uh, police and the military in order to silence spaces of articulation, in order to create expanding market opportunities uh, through um, uh, the cultivation of spaces for big data analytics and smart uh, decision making. Of course, with COVID-19, one of the things you wonder then is that what happens to all this smart uh, decision making uh, when it comes to actually managing the crisis? Um, the narrative of efficiency through technocratic management forms that infrastructure of um, communicative inversions where um, data-based large-scale solutioning uh, becomes a way for alleviating poverty. The narrative of uh, neoliberalism that has worked over the last three decades, one where if you bring about development, if you move the um, uh, rural classes from uh, their rural hinterlands into the urban sites, you're alleviating poverty and creating pathways of Mobility, And the thing I want to point out here is that this is not just a, a neo-fascist imaginary of a particular dispensation, but this imaginary has been cultivated over the decades, you know, with um, figures such as Nandan Nilekani, you know, in my uh, book, um, um, Imagining Indian Discourse, where I look at elite discourses, uh, one of the things I found, find through that analysis of elite discourses is how uh, technocratic figures, you know, owners of large scale technology uh, corporations have been integral to cultivating this image of a smart imaginary and a smart uh, future based on this idea that when you, you know, bring about this form of development, it actually moves people out of poverty. And this, of course, becomes then the basis for justifying techniques of surveillance where large scale technologies are deployed to surveil, um, working alongside, of course, uh, the preponderance of e-participation, e-governance, e-democracy, e-deliberation, which is sort of, of course, all uh, e-sites for participation and participatory futures, of course, for a particular uh, class, the elite classes and the upwardly um, aspiring middle classes, while uh, sites of articulation of the poor are systematically erased. So smart displacements are built upon enabling aesthetic transformations in our aesthetic um, imaginaries, where the aesthetic of the smart future of ima ima imageries of uh, efficiency and effectiveness driven by technology occupy our imaginations, um, where displacement from rural livelihoods and from the commons becomes a justification for um, an almost a necessity for this kind of smart development, working alongside then displacement from rights to the city and from voicing uh, rights. Uh, so the same kind of um, English educated middle classes and upwardly mobile classes that talk about rights that talk about justice to the city are absolutely okay with uh, the erasure of the poor and the working classes from these uh, spaces of articulation. So the rights become one kind of rights uh, to be um, uh, transacted through and to be circulated for a particular social class while actually displacing and layering over the rights of uh, a large section of India's underclasses. So smart displacements then constitute the fabric on which 
uh, we see ongoing issues of organizing possibilities of the working classes and the poor. So as the poor have been expelled from their spaces of rural livelihoods and interjected into these urban spaces, their opportunities of organizing have been severely limited with attacks on unions and spaces for collective bargaining and organizing. So uh, opportunities for collectivization have been uh, almost eliminated often under the same narrative of neoliberal growth and poverty um, alleviation, erasing opportunities for re uh, representation and rec recognition of the working classes who then have been um, uh, entered into these margins of the digital infrastructures. So this forms the backdrop on which we witness the kinds of hyper precarization that become evident with COVID-19 where a labor without labor rights, uh, without uh, the ability to articulate rights, have been left at the disposition of the state, um, the urban middle and upwardly mobile classes, and large corporations. Uh, to the extent where, even with respect to the mobility of labor, uh, the decision to expel uh, labor through a lockdown that was decided within four hours, um, uh, all the way from that to um, uh, decisions about whether to allow the labor to move or not, as we see in the example of uh, Karnataka, where uh, sort of the pressure put on the state by uh, the construction sector led to particular kinds of decisions. And really think about the ways in which that then impacts um, the, the, what we understand in terms of mobility, the ability to move, and the creation of slave-like uh, conditions. Uh, so state capital itself then uh, is uh, reorganized within the logics of capital as an infrastructure for violence that enables uh, the violence to be carried out by uh, state actors, where police and military violence are necessary strategies for smart management. So the kind of violence we see uh, within the backdrop of COVID-19, the violence that is carried out by police um, under the name of um, neoliberal uh, epidemic management and um, often uh, being carried out on the poor and the underclasses becomes justified uh, because uh, these bodies of the poor are discardable and because their uh, debts can be invisibilized. So bodies of the poor become discardable labor and death becomes a necessity almost to the smart economy and its um, modalities of neoliberal management. So uh, this image, and I'm sure um, you have all seen images that are similar to this in terms of um, uh, workers on the streets pretty much carrying um, not only their whatever they could collect with their belongings, but their families uh, seeing, witnessing deaths or accounts of deaths or witnessing uh, accounts of going without food have become part of that uh, uh, discursive space. While at the same time, uh, the voices of workers in making articulations um, about their rights and their rights to the city, their rights to the urban infrastructures that they have built are systematically erased. So I'm going to now read from you some of my field work as I, I wrap up uh, this conversation, some of my field work notes, and I will go back and forth a little bit in doing this. So this is um, uh, based on the ethnographic work I've been carrying out in uh, West Bengal, uh, and particularly in um, sort of the rural margins of West Bengal. And this is a story that was shared with me by uh, Rajiv, who had migrated to Pune. And he was talking about, um, in, this is in 2015, when he was talking about his decision to move to uh, Pune. And he says that, you know, I'm going to go out and see what's there. There is no work here as a day laborer. Uh, and this is sort of the precarization of the rural and the expulsion from the rural uh, that um, we systematically witness in care's work. What work there is, the Lodha, and Lodha is referring to the Lodha tribe, which is a systematically um, uh, disenfranchised uh, tribe, uh, both in terms of policy formations and in discursive constructions, uh, systematically and historically been projected as um, uh, 
uh, thugs or as uh, robbers. Uh, for so many days, I go and stand on the road, the road where the contractors people come to pick up workers, but then I return home. At home, when there is nothing to even get some food, what does the family do? I will go and search for a job. I will have to be away from my family and from this village. So, you know, this conversation, Rajiv and I have, and um, I have changed his name to protect his identity here. But this conversation that we had, this was in 2015, and he was thinking about uh, this process of migration. This is the conversation that we have in the month of May. Uh, by this point, of course, we have had a number of conversations. The care team has been working with them in terms of figuring out you know, ways for him to access resources. But this is what he um, uh, says here. He says, I'm so scared, scared every day for my life. I've run out of money and it's been like this for five weeks now since the lockdown started. There was no job. The boss did not say anything. Pay the pending wages of the last months. So he's demanding for his pay for the wages that he hasn't received yet. I have no money and so I'm living on no food for the past many days. And this hunger is painful to my body. It hurts my stomach. I don't know how long I can live like this. Now, when you attend to this narrative and um, to Rajiv's um, articulation for change, you know, when we talk about, you know, what would he like to see changed? And the first thing he says is that I would like to have a say in what's going on. I, there, I'm living in the midst of uncertainty. You know, I have no access to information. No one is really communicating anything to me. I want to be able to know what is going on. And then I need to be able to get my wage for uh, the work that I have done that is rightfully uh, mine uh, to get. Uh, similarly, Nobin, who had migrated to Bangalore. And remember, you know, now juxtapose Rajiv's narrative in the earlier point with the Pune smart city. And, you know, one of the questions we should be asking is, what happened to all that smart governmentality, right? Uh, so for Nobin, who had migrated to Bangalore, another site of this technology imaginary, e-participation, e-democracy, and all that, he says, can anyone hear what the worker is going through? What our pain is like? Can anyone even see us? You know, this sort of uh, offers a register for this invisibilizing of the death and the pain. <coughs> have been here with the whole number of us. There are so many people that are here. I'm worried that I'm infected because there are so many people here. I've also heard one worker who lived here has died. No one can see us. No one can see in this city, meaning see us in this city. The Babus, you know, this refers to the middle classes and the owners. They can't see us. So, you know, this really captures, I think, at its heart, this process of invisibilizing that makes up the Joomla Republic. Uh, so within this backdrop, then I want to leave with offering these imaginaries uh, to think about what needs to change. We need to consider the possibilities of radical resistance. And to me, um, the radical resistance is fundamentally communicative. It is anchored in imaginings of radical democracy. And ra we see evidence of this in terms of communicative agency, worker agency on an everyday basis amidst this pandemic. So here you have this image. And of course, you know, you have seen the extent of police atrocities that have been normalized across um, uh, states. Uh, in this one instance, the workers rose up and they said that we are not going to tolerate this. We are not going to take this. So this kind of contextually anchored resistance offers us strategic anchors for redoing our present and our futures uh, that become the basis for us to consider what are the discursive anchors to communicative uh, participation on the basis of the rights of uh, the poor and the precarious classes and their material participation in processes of redistributing um, wealth and economic resources um, uh, as, as sites for articulating labor rights. Uh, what then I ask are these processes of undoing uh, the hegemonic communicative inversions of participation and redoing uh, participation. And finally, I wrap up with this question for you. How can we imagine uh, the basis for co-creating habits of democracy in the words of Gayatri Spivak in the midst of India's um, urban subaltern margins. You know, subalternity very much is incorporated into 
uh, the city into its urban infrastructures as a site of erasure, as well as a site of profiting out of subaltern labor. How then can we occupy the state uh, through the participation of the poor in democratic processes of occupying and reimagining the state? Thank you so much for uh, participating. I look forward to chatting more with you and it's been my pleasure conversing. So thank you again, Devina and uh, the team at uh, the University of Hyderabad. Um, thank you so much, Mohan, sir. This presentation is particularly important uh, because the current pandemic makes uh, the deep inequalities written into our neoliberal 21st century cities visible, irrefutable, and I think you show us a possible way out when you say that we can make it more participatory. We can uh, include them in, in, in the discourse and maybe find a way out together. Um, so we have live questions from the Zoom meeting participants shortly. And um, I will ask you all the Zoom chat and the FB live comment questions uh, together towards the end of the meeting, Mohan sir. Um, I request participants to please raise their hands and I will announce your names in order. If you can't find the raise your hand button, please let me know that you would like to ask a question via personal message on Zoom chat here. Uh, kindly turn on your microphone and or video depending on your connection when it is your turn to ask. Please keep your questions as brief as possible so we can have maximum interaction with Mohan sir. And we will take questions till 12.45 only to manage time better. Okay, so uh, we already have questions coming in. And uh, the first question is from Professor Usha Raman. Um, Usha ma'am, uh, if you can hear me. Yes, thank you. Yeah, so um, thank you Mohan for that um, really um, good lecture. I mean, I don't know how to describe it because you raised many, many questions. Um, but uh, I know that I... I'm not going to hog all the time, so I will try and ask just one. Um, so you started fairly early on in the talk talking about the logics by which, um, you know, large funding agencies, for instance, articulate um, um, when they call, for instance, for development projects and so on. Um, and I'm, I'm thinking almost that we need to have, just like we have, uh, you know, um, uh, trigger alerts or we have disclaimers um, that we need to have um, in every funding call that these are the logics of, uh, you know, that we operate by. Um, so as scholars or as people who apply for these, this kind of funding, uh, how do we uncover the logic so that we can subvert it? Um, you know, what, how would you respond to that? <laughs> That's a great uh, question. And I think I've sort of um, uh, three tiered response to that. You know, the first thing I would say is um, uh, recognizing that we inhabit the neoliberal university. Um, and this is a global phenomenon that um, uh, sort of predicates our existence on certain kinds of funding uh, models, even. Um, and I think, you know, the starting point has to be about. Um, questioning that at a macro level uh, in terms of what universities prioritize and what should uh, the role of academics be and what should the role of academia be as such. You know, and, and one of the examples that I can think of in that sense is that when you think about smart city projects, um, there is funding to carry out e-engagement or participatory engagement projects with the smart city. But you know, if you ask, is there funding available to critically interrogate the smart city? There isn't, you yeah. know? Uh, so I think we need to actually take back our democracies and take back our states so that uh, these structures themselves can be reorganized under different uh, logics altogether. You know, that's sort of my very radical point. Um, the second point I will say is uh, that we need to cultivate um, uh, habits of critically interrogating funding calls. And uh, that is also something then uh, that we need to cultivate among our graduate students and fellow researchers is how do you critically narrative um, and uh, interrogate the narratives, the communicative inversions uh, that are sold through the proposals. 
uh, which brings me to my third point. Part of that critical interrogation, I think, is to question power. Um, is to ask really who is holding the power, uh, for what agendas, toward what purposes, and um, you know if we are actually going to invert or subvert these logics, we need to be very aware of the workings of power, and then really think through how we can place our bodies in solidarity with the subaltern classes and with the working classes, as opposed to working to um, further extend the agendas of the state and private corporations. Okay. So other questions I will send you separately. Thank you. Great. Thank you so much. So next we have uh, Sangeeta Ma'am, um, Professor Sangeeta Bagga. Uh, can you hear me? Thank you. Uh, thank you for this. Um, I think you're touching upon a very interesting point. I mean, the spring of 2020 in the Northern Hemisphere, uh, we're seeing many things becoming visible. And in your engagement with uh, what is happening in the subcontinent of India, um, you, you are uh, pointing to one of these. So what is unfolding in the USA at the moment and its ripple effects in European spaces is what I'm thinking of. I'm, I'm curious about your current ethnographic ongoing study. So can you explicate a little more on that, the seven sites that you mentioned initially, the language of your communicative research? I mean, I'm just having to fill in the blanks in terms of that these are migrants who have earlier on moved from Bengal. So are you engaging with them in Bengali and Mumbai, Hindi and Marathi? So I'm, I'm interested in the nitty gritty of, of your ethnographic work. Thank you so much. So thanks, first of all, for making that broad point about the connections and the interplays. I think that's really critical uh, to look at the ways in which uh, particular inequalities are becoming visible across, visible across spaces, but also how resistance is being articulated across spaces. Now, coming to my ethnographic work, um, my sort of there are two strands to it, you know, the rural component of my ethnographic work is um, primarily and predominantly in uh, West Bengal. Um, they, um, uh, actually, the work predates uh, the uprising in Jongol Mahol, um, uh, which we witnessed uh, around 2000, um, um, 11, 12, uh, 13 and um, goes subsequently after that as well, and really looking at the processes of marginalization and expulsion within the context of um, rural Bengal. The um, urban uh, context of my ethnographic work is primarily with um, low wage migrant laborers and domestic uh, workers that live on the fringes of uh, seven smart city projects, looking at the ways in which they come to understand their lived experiences and um, the possibilities that they consider for labor organizing. So um, across the seven sites, and I've published some snippets out of this work, uh, what is really critical um, is understanding their communicative challenges, notions of communicative justice, as well as um, uh, the solutions. And this is a key part of the culture-centered approach that I work with, which is that what are the kinds of solutions anchored in communicative equality that they imagine and that they want to co-construct. Part of that work then actually becomes one of developing interventions out of that uh, uh, process so that um, uh, they not only imagine, but they materialize specific kinds of communicative infrastructures for boys. I hope that ans answers your question somewhat. Right. Um, so we're going to move on to the next question by Anjali Ma'am, please. Um, if you can hear me, please turn on your microphone and video. Um, yeah. Uh, thank you so much, Professor Datta, for uh, that very insightful talk. Uh, my question is uh, rather basic. How do you place uh, the journalistic coverage of this issue of, of the migrant workers trying to go back to their homes 
how do you place that on the spectrum of communicative participation? Because thanks to certain uh, sites and journalists uh, uh, who've been able to travel along with uh, some of these um, uh, migrant worker families, they, they were able to get some of the voices of those people. And yet these journalistic, uh, you know, uh, products or items or news reports are being produced by a certain class, right? So uh, how, where do you place, place uh, this, you know, kind of coverage? What a, what a great question. Um, uh, you know, I will respond it, uh, to it from the co context of communicative equality and that question in, in terms of who owns the voice infrastructure. So absolutely, I agree with you. And, and some of those accounts have been uh, important, spe especially in terms of the uh, journalists um, walking alongside the migrant workers and getting some of those accounts in. Um, Having said that, I think that if you look at the contemporary uh, media infrastructures, um, that they are very much constituted within a neoliberal logic uh, that is built upon uh, the communicative erasure of the uh, voices of the subaltern margins. So in that sense, the overarching ideology uh, does not really get uh, disrupted. Um, and I think what we ought to be doing is really considering the ways in which we can move from these journalistic accounts to asking what would communicative spaces look like uh, when these are um, owned by um, the uh, rural margins or by the urban migrant uh, margins. You know, I loved um, uh, what P. Sainath said in an interview with uh, Democracy Now! with Amy Goodman. And he said that, you know, if you look at rural reporting over uh, the last uh, decade, uh, that is abysmal in terms of mainstream media because there is absolutely no interest in it. And um, uh, that ideology that the rural is backward, the kind of Nilakani um, ideology and that somehow technology and city are going to move us into this uh, urban utopia is actually uh, dystopian. It produces dystopia. Uh, to ask that question, we need to actually turn, radically think about how do we turn these uh, communicative infrastructures in the hands of the poor and the um, underclasses, you know. So in that sense, I think the work of Pari um, that Sainath works with in terms of uh, people's media is interesting. Uh, mm -hmm. The work that Vinod has been championing for um, uh, decades now in terms of community mm -hmm. radio and uh, community journalism and community-based participatory spaces is really important. But I also think what is critical, and I want to center that, and that's why, you know, in my abstract, I put in this question of left organizing, uh, is that I think it is really important to think about what left organizing is going to look like, uh, because the answer to some of these questions is really um, uh, an actual politics of left uh, that is organized in solidarity with uh, migrant workers. Thank you so much. Okay, next we have Vinod, sir. Um, if you can hear me, please uh, turn on your microphone and video. We'd like to have your question. Yes. Yeah. You can hear me? Yes, Vinod, yeah. yes. Uh, Mohan, uh, thanks for that uh, talk. I think it uh, contributes to what we are uh, going through, struggling to make sense of this uh, incredible uh, drama that we are seeing, uh, witnessing across the country, especially with the migrant labor. Uh, so my my question, uh, I mean, I, I uh, appreciate the structural inequalities that you map out and, and the, uh, the discursive erasures that you point out uh, and the precarity of the labor, uh, you know, uh, and, and who have to deal with these erasures. Uh, you know, one of the things that I am struggling with is how then is agency even possible? Uh, agency even uh, imaginable in this kind of a traumatic uh, situation? I mean, I'm uh, thinking from another context uh, of, you know, what Roland Barthes has talked about, the traumatic uh, photograph. You know, I mean, the the, the trauma is so incredible uh, that uh, it evacuates, uh, you know, all meaning. And it's very difficult to even make sense of uh, what is happening uh, to themselves, you know, to, to the migrant labor. Uh, 
how then, I mean, this is a situation, like you said, where we are talking about uh, discardable bodies, uh, actual physical death on our highways and on our railway tracks. I mean, how, how can they even imagine any kind of agency to respond to this? Hmm. Again, you know, love this question. And, you know, um, as you know, I know a, a large part of my work is focused on this question about what does yes. agency yes. look yes. like, you know. And um, I would say a couple of things. First is uh, that, you know, what has been most powerful in these conversations and sort of particularly in the... Um, uh, digital um, ethnography component of this work in observing how some workers that can get access to uh, mobile devices or internet are articulating uh, specific imaginaries is that one uh, agency is already there in terms of how they are coping with uh, these massive, as you put it very rightly, these trauma inducing uh, conditions. So agency in the form of uh, helping each other out, um, uh, mutual support and um, community aid. You know, it's really interesting because on the other hand, I'm sit sitting here in El Teroa in, in, and, and noticing, you know, very privileged people talking about community mutual aid um, and, and, and seeing that actually in the, at the, in the midst of sort of the margins of the margins, this, this notion of, you know, standing up to support each other with whatever minimal that one has. So I think that is a beautiful enactment of agency. I also see agency in uh, standing up to this kinds, these kinds of torture and violence and police atrocities um, and sort of even articulating and challenging the randomness of the lockdown. So, you know, I have multiple accounts of uh, participants saying that, you know, this lockdown was so random, nothing was thought through nothing was planned you know one um, uh, participant says that i went to this bus station and the buses were all so full and how could i even protect myself from covid-19 and maintain social distance uh, when this is how i have to tr uh, travel and i think this is a great example of um, agency and how it is being enacted the key question i think in some ways um, uh, we know this that in terms of, I think the question I ask myself is what does it mean to be in solidarity with these expressions of agency? And more importantly, you know, I'm really interested in, as I kept referring to earlier, uh, the possibilities of a transformative politics. Uh, so much of, um, um, you know, contemporary politics works through the erasure of um, uh, the agentic spaces of articulation. So I guess my question is, how can we transform politics theoretically uh, to be in solidarity with uh, these sides of articulating agency? Thank you. Um, sorry to uh, sort of say something in, in, in the middle of all of this, but I saw a few people sharing memes regarding the very thing that you mentioned, where they have pictures of buses which are packed and uh, uh, they've highlighted the section on the bus, a sticker which says only 20 people allowed at once. Um, and then the way you go means uh, the fun bit fit or the soft bus yes. bit fit. Um, yes. So next we have uh, the Did last I live. One thing in response to that also. Yes, please. Uh, yes. So, you know, I was recently invited to a WHO collaborative on um, what the uh, sort of developing um sort of a conceptual piece on policy prescriptions for what happens when we come out of the lockdown, you know? And it was beautiful because, you know, these experiences and these accounts of agency, worker agency, you know, they, they, they I think point to one basic thing, which is that how our states imagine even the lockdown and its prescriptions of social distancing and their fundamental inability uh, to consider uh, the poor, and the conditions they live in is basically a matter of how our democracies have been reorganized to serve um, a particular echelon of uh, society. And unfortunately, I think the possibilities of the left have been systematically erased because we are too happy with cultural artifacts and um, cultural performances at Habitat Center and thinking that that's radical without really thinking about what fundamentally does it take for us to reorganize our affinities and desires to be actually uh, 
alongside the struggles of the poor, you know? Um, so we have room for one last live question from Tirumal, sir. Um, sir, if you can please uh, unmute yourself and turn on your video if possible. Can you hear me, Tirumal, sir? Oh, yeah, there he is. Uh, thanks for that presentation, Professor Mohandatta. Uh, I find uh, very few communication scholars talking with such uh, excitement about communication inequality. And uh, at least one of the few lectures in the last 20 years, I think, I've, I've come across somebody uh, uh, getting so excited about this inequality, question of inequality. Uh, my question, uh, it's not, a, a, uh, my question is, the categories that you're using, especially subaltern, migrants, uh, hyper precarity, uh, they seem to be qualitative categories in some sense. They seem to, in some sense, I mean, not reveal certain concrete life, certain concrete facts about reality. They, uh, it seems to be a homogeneous kind of uh, uh, what shall I say, conception that may hide a lot of diversity and a diversity which is very important for understanding the nuances of inequality. And uh, what is your ethnography uh, uh, like in order to pick on these nuances of inequality? Uh, are you having much sharper categories in which you kind of discern there are very, very different forms of, uh, let's say, um, uh, grades of inequality and uh, qualities of inequalities. Uh, how, how do you elaborate on this fantastic idea of communication inequality in your ethnography? That's Again, what a beautiful question and thank you for asking that. And I think, you know, there are two points to this. First, I will say in terms of a, a strategic articulation, if you think about um, uh, the act of communicating as um, uh, a strategic intervention, you're absolutely right that uh, there are uh, specific reasons why, for instance, in this sharing, um, uh, I walked around specific kinds of conceptual categories in order to work, uh, work through and put forth specific anchors to strategic interventions. Having said that, absolutely that, you know, within uh, sort of the, the uh, framework of communicative inequality, for instance, you have various forms and layers of inequality. One example that I will walk through for uh, is, um, you know, there are, uh, I've been interviewing families of um, uh, workers where the whole family had migrated to um, uh, Noida um, in order to uh, secure a living. And uh, so there are layers of inequality in terms of inequality within the household, uh, gendered inequality in terms of uh, the, uh, the difference in power uh, and the ways in which uh, the husband and the wife experience that, as well as inequalities in terms of the kinds of jobs that they uh, did. So in, in some ways, you know, one thing that is really emerging from this is that in many ways, domestic workers, for instance, seem to have had um, uh, greater opportunities of at least some form of access uh, because of the ways in which uh, circuits of altruism and kindness worked in these gated communities and how norms were produced, as opposed yeah. to male migrant workers and the yeah. body of the male migrant worker that was expelled out, often without sort of access to those spaces of kindness and articulations yeah. of kindness. So that's just one example to say that how yeah. this pandemic is being felt is very layered and textured in many ways. Yeah. But I also yeah. think, you know, I want to come back to one thing, the question that is interesting from this work for me at least, because I'm interested in you know, what real change or actual change on the ground looks like, is that also how can um, uh, sort of particular identities be congealed yeah. as a strategic basis for uh, organizing yeah. and yeah. social change, you know? Thank, Thank you for that. Thank you.
Uh, so, sir, now we have a few questions via chat and comments. And the first one, I think, um, uh, I, I love this question. It's from our own PhD student, Hazina. Uh, I've just posted it in chat in case you want to see the entire uh, question. And essentially, she's asking um, us about um, how suborganization plays a central role in building these smart cities to begin with. So I will walk through, you know, Gayatri Spivak's um, articulation of the new subalterns. And if you think about, you know, the differentiation that she makes there is that if you uh, think in the classic literature in subaltern studies, the subaltern is a position of erasure that is produced uh, because of its lack of access to mobility um, uh, into and through the structures of capital. And then she talks about the new subaltern as uh, sort of being the specific sites of incorporation where her or his body become the sites of profiteering. So I find that uh, sort of theoretical, theoretical lens really work well in understanding this uh, process of uh, the incorporation and uh, erasure of uh, the urban subaltern. And it, this is not just in India. You know, I've been working quite a bit in Singapore and uh, you see this at work very much in Singapore, where sort of the uh, low wage uh, Bangladeshi and Tamil migrant workers that have pretty much formed and uh, put their labor into forming the infrastructure of uh, Singapore smart urbanism, and which is really critical for India because Singapore uh, offers a register for imaginary for India's 100 smart cities project. Now that works through the erasure of the labor of the uh, migrant worker, where the migrant worker is invisibilized but also where strict forms of disciplining work to silence the organizing capacities and opportunities of migrant workers. Uh, similarly, then within the context of India's smart urban infrastructures, uh, what you also see is the deployment of security or securitization um, of all the way from security guards uh, to police that are integral to that production of this fundamental sense of um, uh, insecurity, um, that if you actually speak up, uh, you will be hurt. Uh, there is the likelihood of violence. Uh, you will, of course, lose your job. So these kinds of processes are at work to invisibilize. So one of the things I want to um, argue here, Nazneen, is that this process of invis invisibilizing is not just um, as if you fail to notice. Uh, it is also an active, violent process, including the powers of state and the um, um, uh, security apparatus to do the work of erasing. Um, so we've gone a little over time, sir, and with your permission, I would like to extend it by 10 more minutes. Because we have a few more questions. Okay, thank you so much. So uh, another question has come in from Sushmita Pandit from Kolkata. And I think it's uh, rather important that we uh, address this question. I've just posted it in chat for everyone to see. She's asking if uh, you think media has sensationalized the migrant issue by depicting images of workers and showing certain kind of videos to generate public sympathy. I, for one, would believe we haven't done enough. I, okay, I want to get at this question at sort of three layers. First of all, I want to interrogate what we mean by sensationalizing and how we uh, define what is sensationalized and sensationalized for whom, for whose sense of aesthetic, uh, for instance. So often what we might find as sensational to our um, middle class palettes or aesthetic is the everyday reality of um, migrant workers. Imagine a little girl walking for kilometers and then dying um, uh, to account for that story and that lived reality uh, might be sensational for um, uh, a particular middle class imaginary, but it is the lived reality for uh, the working classes and precarious classes of India. Now, of course, um, uh, media pick particular stories because they fit into networks and logics of profiteering. And the production of spectacle itself um, contributes to uh, profiteering, you know, all the way from 
the circulation of uh, news outlets to the likes, shares, and the affective economies that are generated by it, which is why I argue that we have to think beyond this uh, to say that uh, what are the communicative infrastructures that are owned by the uh, subaltern classes? So do we actually have uh, migrant media platforms, migrant owned media platforms uh, that are radically embedded in communicative equality? And what then if these platforms were owned by migrant workers uh, owned and driven by logics that are anchored in the, their lived realities, uh, what kind of discursive spaces would be would we be uh, working with? Um, one of the things I think that happens with mainstream media. So I will give you one example. You know whether it is um, uh, uh, Barkhad Dutt or uh, NDTV that when they pick up these stories, um, of course they incorporate these stories, which is like you know when World Bank um, uh, uh, runs its Voices of the Poor project. It incorporates the voices of the poor in order to keep its logic intact. And the same way, uh, sort of NDTV incorporates these voices in order to keep its very much uh, neoliberal market friendly logics um, intact. So, uh, on one hand, yes, Devin, I ag agree with you that the media need to do much more. But I think the broader question is also related to media ownership. Uh, what do we need to do to do our activism and um, advocacy work and democratic political work to actually transform models of media ownership and actually change these configurations of ownership uh, so that they are more grounded in communicative equality, you know. So that's a question of uh, media trade unions, media labor organizations, media collectivization, uh, media cooperatives and, you know, a whole uh, different set of uh, engagements with media ownership patterns. Absolutely. Um, another question that has come in from, uh, from our PhD student, Anirudh. Uh, I think um, you've met him in one of the conferences. Hi, Anirudh. Uh, <laughs> so he, his connection is a little spotty, so he wants me to ask on his behalf. Uh, he's interested in understanding more about how we um, can engage and negotiate with questions of political economy of state-sponsored projects. And how important is... Um, keeping all of this in mind, especially during the current pandemic? And how can we as researchers empathize, um, add value to the agency of indigenous communities in regards to their expertise and solidarities and epistemic values? Brilliant question. Hey, first of all, all the best for your field work. I know you're in the midst of it, so all the best with it. Um, uh, this is such a powerful question in terms of uh, being skeptical of the political economy of um, um, existing development interventions. And I think part of that has to be a starting point with um, questioning the sacred cows, like public-private partnership. What is it? It really is a form of large-scale privatization of our commons and public resources. So uh, when you think about a foundation running a PPP project in partnership with the state, with no state funding, right? Like you saw with the urban Pune, smart um, uh, Pune project, you really have to critically interrogate what do they mean when they say uh, no state funding? How are they actually uh, taking uh, public resources and public properties and reorganizing them uh, to profit the capitalist classes? Um, so that's the starting point. And I th think I'm very clear in my own work then that that starting point has to lead us to an imaginary um, that seeks to dismantle this kind of um, uh, capitalist profiteering. I mean, I see no other way out of that. And I think here I agree with um, Naomi Klein when she says that this pandemic and, and with um, uh, Arundhati Ghosh when they argue that this pandemic is a potent, this pandemic is an opening for reimagining and the work of reimagining has to be that uh, we are not going to engage with the status quo logics, but rather we are going to dismantle them, we are going to radicalize them, and we are going to um, uh, transform them. So what new imaginaries can be created? And that's where I think uh, the political economy work is central in solidarity with um, indigenous communities and solidarity with rural margins, because I think part of that challenge is how do we place our bodies on the line? Uh, you know, and I have experienced this significantly in my work, you know, uh, being under state surveillance, various forms of disciplining deployed by the state, that when you speak uh, these truths, uh, the state will come after you because 
uh, the state has been reorganized as a tool, um, extractive tool to enable capitalist extraction. So the question for each one of us is, I think, you know, when we place our bodies uh, in solidarity with uh, subaltern communities, um, how are we going to create new kinds of political economies, uh, but also how are we going to negotiate uh, universities, academia, state structures within which we inhabit, and how do we reorganize them? So I think within that context, I see these issues not disparate from campus activism and student activism and uh, student movements. You know, we need to be doing yeah, and here I, I, I disagree with Dipesh Chakravarti, where he says uh, that, you know, students shouldn't be involved in politics. I think that it is each of our job to be involved in politics, uh, in reorganizing it and reconfiguring it. Because the political is personal. <laughs> so uh, the last question that we have today is from Madhavi Ma'am from the department. And uh, she's thanking you for the wonderful talk. And she's... Um, asking you to take this moment and reimagining a post-lockdown uh, normal as an opportunity to push for a structural shift in the way the informal sector workers are uh, treated uh, within the industry to fuel uh, our economy. So, you know, like you mentioned, the portal, uh, the lockdown or the pandemic being a portal to um, uh, maybe imagine a new normal. So uh, I think it's a brilliant question to end with. We could uh, end with what we imagine or what you imagine uh, the new normal could be. Hi, Madhavi. What a, again, what a beautiful question. You know, since it's an invitation to imagining, uh, I don't want to take on that space with my imaginations. I just will offer some uh, tentative invitations to imagining together. Uh, one of the things, as you rightly point out, is how can do we support in solidarity informal organ uh, uh, worker organizing? And how do we uh, rework labor unions uh, with a radical agenda that is committed to organizing and representing um, informal workers? I think, and, 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 and spaces and collectives uh, that are owned by uh, workers in articulating these claims. I think that is the pivotal uh, starting point. And, and, and I think this is where, and I uh, often articulate this to my union organizing and left friends within the context of India, that um, uh, it's a significant um, opportunity for the left um, uh, to recognize its limits in terms of its inability to systematically represent informal workers because of the model of unionizing and the ways in which the prevalent model has worked. And I think that needs to be fundamentally transformed in terms of thinking through how do you represent um, the interests um, of those um, uh, precarious classes that have traditionally not counted as working classes. So even redefining what is a working class, because you know these are the working classes. And I will end with one example. While doing this field work, I was once talking to a civil engineer at um, a big five construction company in India. And he was saying that, you know, they have many migrant worker deaths um, uh, at the work site. Um, and sometimes what the company does is that when these deaths happen, uh, they put the body and construct around it. Um, I mean, you think about the violence that is built into this. Uh, but part of the reason why this violence can perpetuate itself is because of um, the absence of worker um, organizing at the construction sites. So we have to change that, you know, we have to actually make policy changes and push back on the neoliberal order so that there are actual bases for organizing in these spaces. I, that would be my invitation to a starting point for reimagining the post-pandemic uh, social order. Uh, so while we have more questions coming in, we don't have time for them. Um, I would appreciate it if you could send those questions to our administrator and we will bundle them all together and email them to Mohan sir and then we will post the response on the department Facebook page. Um, this is all the time we have today. Thank you so much Mohan sir. Thank you so much. Thanks to all of you for engaging and thanks to the University of Hyderabad. Thank you, Devina. It's been such a joy. And hopefully this is sort of, you know, this moment that we are in is the beginning of uh, really reworking uh, new forms of organizing.